Yes. Okay. It looks like we are live over on YouTube. Welcome just everybody to our uh, monthly book club discussion. This month I have with me uh, Agatha, as Shay and James couldn't make it. So hopefully they'll be able to be here next month. But the book we're going to be discussing this month, well, I guess before we get going, hi, Agatha. <laughs> Hi, Dana. <laughs> uh, how are you doing? I'm great. <laughs> Good. Anything new and exciting? Well, we have great vacation. And I'm 39 years old now as of Monday. <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> it was Happy fun. birthday. Thank you. <laughs> Good deal. Good deal. Well, um, so the book we're going to be discussing today is called True Refuge by Tara Brock. And um, it's a book basically about mindfulness and kind of accepting and making peace with what is. Uh, the book we're going to be discussing next month is called Waking the Tiger. It's about healing trauma and it's by Peter Levine. This is an older copy of the book. You can find these books and pretty much all of the books that we're going to be discussing um, over on my website, but it's still currently down. We're still working on it. So hopefully that'll be up here in the very near future. Also wanted to mention that our book club is sponsored by Audible. So if you would like to support the channel and if you would like to get a membership to Audible, uh, please head on over to audibletrial.com slash thrive after abuse and consider signing up. It's a audio books are just the coolest thing ever. So <laughs> I'm a <Yes>. junkie. <laughs> Yes, I know. I think we both are. We both <laughs> Eight books a month for something. <laughs> yeah, it's it's great. It's wonderful. It's a great way to just, you know, uh, when you're driving someplace or cleaning the house or doing other things to so just throw on an audio book. And... Yeah, or if you worry, I think it's better than watching TV. Yeah, I agree. So, yeah, it's, it's awesome. So they also have, I don't know if you know, they have... Um, Gosh, we're really getting good stuff for Audible now. They have um, foreign language on Audible too now. I mean, for a while. So it's worth to try if you want to learn new language too. Oh, interesting. I did mm -hmm. not realize that. Yeah, they do that. I'll have to check it out. So what did you think? Um, so let's just hop into it. What were some of your takeaways from the book? Oh, God. I always start, oh, God, when I'm not really <laughs> in love with the book. <laughs> Okay, so why were you not in love with the book? Okay, so my main point is I'm a Christian. So I live in a Christian philosophy, like my whole life. So that book didn't really have much value to me because it's a completely different worldview. And I think if you are someone who is already inquiring into Buddhism and just, you know, want to see yourself you know, living more and understanding situation through that worldview. This is a great book for you then. <laughs> for me, it was just like, you know, and I read a lot about Buddhists already. So I, I, I think, but the only really cool thing was I saw how she's using Buddhists inside of her practice with people, which was really yeah. interesting. But as like a book to help me with something, didn't really have value to me, to be honest with you. It was interesting, but it wasn't valuable. So hmm. yeah. that's interesting. I, I, I guess I didn't see it so much as Buddhism. It was more to me, just more mindfulness and kind of that mind body awareness, which I know is, is a big part of Buddhism, kind of the surrendering to the present moment. And, um, wow. Hmm. Like, she was like, that was the most Buddhistic, if that's a word, book we've read so far. Because she was like using all the names of the Buddha. Her whole life is inside of the Buddhist practice. Like she even lived in like a yoga community. <laughs> it was like, she was like totally doing it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess for me, it was more of what she was saying about mindfulness. I just felt like it applied to everybody like that you yeah. don't a person doesn't need it to me there was no conflict between 
yeah. religion and mindfulness. Um, well, there's a different way to be mindful as a Christian and different way to be mindful as a Buddhist. Because it's like, if she does say there, for example, prayers. So prayer in a Christian worldview is a different thing than a Buddhist worldview. Because in a Buddhist worldview, basically you're like, let me be loved. That's considered a prayer. You're just saying mm-hmm. it like out into the universe almost. And that's prayer. Mm-hmm. In a Christian worldview, we pray to God. So th- it's not like, it's not, not the action that you take will be a different, but the context of it, it's completely different. But do you think like even paying attention to the emotions that surface and making peace with the present moment and all of that? It's different in a Christian worldview because we kind of acknowledge it in our relationship with God. And I think in the Buddhist also like you can, there's, I'm not sure if I'm right about it, but it's almost like you can source yourself. And in a Christian world, we cannot, God is our source. So there it's like you, it's like you don't need God in a Buddhism. Right. You don't need God there. In a Christian world, I cannot go about God. I need God. Like I need my Jesus every day. (laughs) So so (laughs) it's like, I'm not saying I'm at I'm I'm at conflict with the book because I'm 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 not like it's not like I'm gonna make a case against this book, mm-hmm. but I it's like I almost want, here's what I really wanted to say. It's so funny because I was thinking about it the other day that if there was no Jesus in the world, like if Jesus never happened, and if I was never a Christian, like if there was no God, this would be probably a great book for me because that would be my second choice. But God is my first choice. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense. So if Jesus never happened, it will be okay with Buddha for me. But like for me, Jesus is like the higher ground. And this is like one step behind for me. So that's, that's, that's for me how it, how it presents itself to me in my worldview. Like I'm more happy with Jesus. And I, I, I have my, my Buddhist friends like who actually do like they have this. Like she actually wrote that too. Like they have, she has an altar at home. She prays. My friend, she does the same thing. And so I could kind of, you know, like identify how it looks in real life because my friend does that. And it's like, I understand it, but it doesn't mean much to me personally. I don't know. It's funny. Like it doesn't help me. It's not helpful to me. For me, it's helpful to pray to God. That makes sense to me. So yeah, I'm not in conflict with it. It's just, yeah, I I feel like I have something better. (laughs) So yeah, I think every I every person in every religion feels that they have <laughs> the truth, right? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm sure she thinks she has the best thing ever. I get it. <laughs> but I feel like, no, I have the best thing ever. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> okay, so, yeah. so let's talk about what um, can benefit, I guess, people here. Do you want me to start since your notes went away <laughs> um yeah. okay sorry okay. <laughs> just so here- to tell everyone what happened why i don't have notes i make notes on audible but i didn't think this book has so much value to me so i returned it already <laughs> so, <laughs> so my notes went away with the book <laughs> gotcha um so some of my takeaways from the book was that she'd said that there are three main keys to overcoming fear obsessive beliefs and um finding peace and happiness. And those three keys are truth of the present moment, uh, self-love for what is, and awareness of how we are feeling. And so that's really kind of this mind-body surrendering to the present moment. And her background, um, actually, this book is the second book that I believe she wrote. The first one was called Radical Acceptance. Mm -hmm. And this book, she, um, I I watched a bunch of videos by her as well. So I'm not sure if things are blurring together in my mind, but at some point she had shared that she has some sort of uh, chronic uh, debilitating uh, disease and that her health. I'm sorry, fibromyalgia, I think she has something like that. Um, I, I don't remember maybe, but she was talking about having to kind of make peace with the fact that her health is continually um, degenerating and that Mm -hmm. there's just things that she can no longer do. And that was a big gateway for her to um, really find peace in the, the midst of pain. 
in the midst of suffering. And it was so in my notes, actually. So it's, it's really crazy. I found it very interesting because mm-hmm. she, I don't know why I, for me it was, it was just so fascinating almost, but in a negative way, because she had such a healthy lifestyle. Like she describes that she would run and do yoga and like meditate and like be so, so mindful. And still she got sick like that. Yeah. Well, and it was like, wow. Like, why would it happen? Like I could not like, cause we, we live in this world when we think like if we do the right thing, mm-hmm. like people have their like, you know, like, oh, it's going to be fine. You're just going to be healthy. But sometimes no, you're not. And you just, so you, and it's, I love how she did not, just give up on her way of living, but she kind of embraced it and she used it how to like, just, you know, progress with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I, um, so she had, she came up with this whole, this acronym that kind of encapsulates her process for mm-hmm. how to make peace with what is basically. And she calls it rain R A I N. And that, The whole purpose of RAIN is to awaken a recognition of self-awareness. So it's to bring us fully into the present moment because the problem with fear, fear is, especially anxiety, it's fear of things that haven't happened yet. It's a future. So we're living in the future. We're fearing the future. Mm -hmm. Obsessive beliefs um, or obsessive thinking Mm -hmm. is... It, it robs us of the present moment because we're thinking about things that either already had like the past mm-hmm. or we're thinking about things in the future. And um, so we have to slow all of this down. And so the R in RAIN stands for recognize what is happening. Mm-hmm. So if we're finding ourselves feeling depressed, anxious, any type of unpleasant emotion to, to recognize what we're feeling and to be honest with ourselves and um then okay so then we can be honest and like okay i'm feeling uh i'm feeling anxious or i'm feeling um and then exploring what that feels like physically Mm -hmm. and what we're thinking about at the time and the a stands for allowing life to be what it is so instead of fighting against feeling this way And this is, these are kind of two main differences with a lot of therapy. So you have cognitive behavioral therapy, which it's all about changing our thinking about the present moment, right? But then you have mindfulness-based therapy, which is about making peace with the present moment. And I think both approaches have value. It's, I think there's a time and place for both of them, but, um, and I don't think that they're contradictory necessarily, but. Anyway. Well, DBT embraces both of them and tries to kind of find the balance between mindfulness and changing your thinking, right? That's that's what we kind of like DBT, to be honest. Yes, but DBT, I think it's more about um, different types of like limiting beliefs and mm-hmm. it involves certain amounts of emotional regulation, but... Um, no, I, I mean, I don't want to go to the details, but you, you mm-hmm. do embrace more mindfulness Mm -hmm. and then you change some of those false beliefs but you're not trying to reframe the reality in a dbt as much like right but a cognitive it's a lot about just reframing the reality yes like the thinking about the reality because this this always makes me laugh i mean like it doesn't matter how you think about reality it's gonna be the same (laughs) just like (laughs) i'm sorry cracks me up that's so, so much Mm. Uh, yeah I think there's a time and place for reframing it um, and I think it really can mm-hmm. help it but it can also be really damaging to a person because mm-hmm. it, it can unintentionally minimize their experience and what they're feeling um, by forcing them to look at it kind of that uh, well, what would you call it like toxic positivity to continue yes. on the bright side and to make the situation work for them. And there is a time and place where people are in pain and they, they need to acknowledge that pain and feel that pain and just be there. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, especially if you are in an abusive relationship or out of abusive relationship, mm-hmm. like it doesn't matter. You can't, I mean, if you want, you can reframe an abusive partner into, Oh, he just doesn't know how to love me partner. 
that's not helpful. Yeah. So, yeah, I agree. So the, okay. So a is the allowing life to be what it is. I stands for investigate in your inner experience with kindness. And then in stands for non-identification or non-judgment. So the in, investigating our inner experience with kindness is paying attention or noticing different physical sensations in our body and mm-hmm. how we are experiencing, we'll just say anxiety, for example, how we are experiencing anxiety physically, and then kind of, and to keep going, like what this is about. So if we're feeling anxious about a job interview, okay, well then what does this mean to me? Like what message does this anxiety have for me? And just continue to keep questioning it. So it could be, Um, We think that we're having anxiety about a job interview, but the reality is we're afraid that they're not going to like us, that that we're not going to get hired, that we're not going to have, we're, you know, um, not going to get the job and therefore we're going to be back to square one and it's so time consuming and that we're not going to have, we're going to run out of money and all kind, and then all of this stuff tends to be really deep seated about, you know, why we think that they aren't going to hire us. And there's a lot of things that can come up if we can continue to kind of dig Mm -hmm. like, what is, what message does this anxiety have for us and where is this coming from? And um, to, instead, and instead of fighting against it or arguing with ourselves, just approach that emotion and those messages with love and um, just kind of love and and self-compassion and then the the end part of that, that non-identification or non-judgment is realizing that we are not our emotions, that our emotions mm-hmm. just surface within us and um, that it's okay to feel them and then to kind of watch them like clouds passing by, like they kind of just change mm-hmm. shape and different things come up and then they're gone and then they just, they f- flow through us. So I think. I think she, I mean, I don't like the form she put it on because she put those meditation at the end of each chapter. I think it would be super helpful if she gathered all those meditation and she put it at the end of the book and like chapters about, you know, meditations. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they were pretty good. And one, one of them about the rain process was, was pretty good because I, I, I think that's the only one that I actually listened to. Yeah, I like the different cool. meditations. And I agree with you. I think it would have been uh, good to have them all mm-hmm. in one spot. Uh, another another main takeaway, I ha- well, two more main takeaways I had from the book. One of them was about, j- yet again, this is, I think, the third or fourth book we've heard this mentioned in. And, and I think it definitely bears repeating is the importance of safety, emotional safety and physical safety when a person is trying to heal. And- yeah. So if a person is seeing a life coach or a therapist, having that rapport is so vital because in order for a person to get out of that fight or flight state, they need to be able to to switch over to their parasympathetic system, which is the whole kind of rest and digest. And Mm -hmm. we only switch over to that when we feel safe. And so- Oh, you know what I've learned? Sorry, mm -hmm. in my yoga class that if- putting your hands on heart it, this this is not like just like it's not spiritual it's just that your body when you actually have feel the heartbeat under your heart you're actually activating your parasympathetic hmm. like it's phys- it's biological like just because it's like you are aware of the heartbeat and that calms you down and that helps you to in tune with your breath like That's it's crazy right yeah I have that, that's why people sometimes during meditation they tell you like put your hands on the heart and that really helps to to get this whole you know body calm down and the other really cool thing is if you want to like meditate and get in almost like a state like mini hypnosis you try to look up while you close eyes like while, you, while your eyes are like while you're closing your eyes that's a another thing that helps you to do that so I don't know I thought that was really interesting that is, that is yeah. interesting yeah I I think um you know just the importance of feeling safe and 
and being in the moment. She had mentioned in the book that a lot of people that are really struggling with um, getting in tune with their emotions really fear that because they're afraid. It's sort of like turning on a fire hose. They're afraid if they they allow themselves to feel certain emotions, they won't be able to shut it off and they won't be able to control that. And I think a mm-hmm. lot of us can definitely relate to that, especially with feelings of anger or sadness. And she was saying um, that people really struggle with, well, when should I start? Like, when is it a good idea for me to start exploring these emotions? And she had said, basically, once you feel emotionally and physically like to some degree grounded and safe um, in your life, which makes complete sense because if your life is full of chaos, opening the door and exploring things that are going to potentially really knock you off center, it's that's not the time to do it, um, to make sure that you're feeling safe and secure and, and calm. And if you're sharing these feelings with anybody else to make sure that they're an emotionally safe person and that you have that rapport with them where you're, cause you're trusting them with the, the deepest, darkest things, you know? Um, well, I, I, I like one thing she said somewhere in the book. Now I just remember it when, um, cause she preaches that, um, allowing, like, instead of, instead of that, right. Allowing, like also like accepting what's, you know, like what's happening. Mm-hmm. But I like how when she was working with one of the clients and this client was actually in like semi-abusive relationship, she, she asked her, and it was crazy because I was think she, she, this was the woman, I think her name was Dana, by the way, and she was like a guard in a prison and she was with this boyfriend who was really, really abusive at some moments and semi-abusive most of the time, semi-abusive, I don't know if that's a good word, like abuse is abuse and there's no semi yeah. <laughs> like, what am I saying? Um, but um, one of the when 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 she's using that that whole practice inside of the you know working with her clients, I love that one of the questions um, she has client ask themselves because she have people ask themselves questions, which is great. I love when people when therapists do that. She says something like, "Is my." acceptance allowing and inviting more abuse into my life or more mistreatment and i think that was brilliant because sometimes people um get wrong the whole idea of acceptance like allowing the reality because it's not about allowing and accepting the abuse it's not about that it's it's about accepting the reality like there is abuse and reacting to it in a proper way because like, if you don't accept that there's abuse as it is happening, accept this as it is happening, then you don't take the proper actions to protect yourself from it. Yes. And, you know, that's why, that's why it's accepted. So it's a radical acceptance. Like even we can say it, it's, you can, you have to radically accept that there is abuse in your life, the situation as it is without trying to make it sense better or worse, just as it is. And then you're reacting to it in a, proper way like you know in a mindful way and I love that because so many times in mindful books this idea is like completely missed overlooked and she actually addresses it like she was the only person that I remember so far she actually addressed it in such a great way Mm -hmm. yeah I agree I think you know um and you and I had a kind of a brief discussion about this I don't know a few weeks ago um about a book you were reading that was more Christian based um, that where he was saying something like basically like your spiritual practice can't supersede your emotional awareness. Oh yeah. Yeah. There is no way you are emotionally mature if you are not spiritually mature. Well, I think he was also saying you can't be spiritually mature if you're not emotionally mature. That's what I'm saying. There's no way, both ways. Yeah. 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 It it, it goes together and it doesn't happen separately. No. Yeah. And I would agree with that because if a person has an unhealthy or dysfunctional ego in any way, shape or form, every single thing that they're going to come across, they're going to interpret it in a dysfunctional way. And that's the downside to, to emotional, I think, immaturity in general is um, and that sounds so judgmental, emotional immaturity, but um, uh, just dysfunction, I guess. No it's, no, it's not. It's not judgmental because 
assessment and judging are similar process, but they are in a different context. So you just you, you know you can you can assess immature emotional immaturity. It's the assessment because you are someone on a scale. There's nothing wrong about saying that. You're not judging anyone. I know that word just feels a little heavier than I feel like it needs to. Because I think <laughs> if anybody, if you were, if somebody were to say, oh, this is emotionally immature, right? Like if they were to describe my behavior as emotionally immature, I would be offended. And I don't think okay, that gonna, that's how, I don't think that do that's that. how. I'll, 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 I will call you emotional baby. <laughs> yeah, I, I just, I don't think that's helpful to have terminology that can be loaded and makes people become defensive and, and shut down. So that's why I'm not a fan of it mm-hmm. from, from like just a, a non-judgmental, like a clinical perspective yeah. of like, this is just a set. But the problem is people don't understand this terminology from a, it's, it feels very harsh because it is so personal when we're talking about behavior i think the point here is that emotionally mature that they are emotionally mature is like telling narcissists they are narcissists it makes no sense so if someone usually people find out themselves looking inside of emotional maturity when they have an idea like wow i think there is maybe i am immature or something like that and they like on their journey so mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I just, I just, yeah, I don't think it's a good idea to tell someone you're emotionally mature. Yeah. <laughs> Come I just on, go up and go, right? <laughs> yeah. I just don't think that's helpful. But like, um, anyways, the point, the point being she, I think there is definitely value in that with, we have to make sure that our thinking is really um, empowered and balanced and coming from a place of um, self-love and self-protection. Mm-hmm. And in order for it to be healthy. And, and if it's not, if it's still skewed um, either way, more towards narcissism or more towards codependency, it's everything is just going to be off balance until we get that balance corrected. And um, so she. Do you remember, hold on a second. Do you remember how she actually described how she had a breakdown instead of her practice as a director of? the yoga institute vaguely I, I thought that was I, I thought that was brilliant because it was very like vulnerable and like very authentic for her to say but basically she showed how you can use any sort of discipline to just beat it up on yourself and she used spirituality to beat up on herself mm. literally mm-hmm. and you know and I think it happens because sometimes you know us uh, that's that's what I wanted to mention that because I think as survivors like we can we can use a process of healing to beat up on ourselves because then we feel like oh we should be there already like you know get mm-hmm. so much better or you know we should do this one more thing and you know put start doing this 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 two more things every week and then another thing and another thing and at the end of it we just become drained and I think she really described that well when she just drained herself doing things that were supposed to nourishing her and Mm -hmm. I think that that was that was brilliant over there yeah yeah I agree and Bonnie that's a great point Bonnie makes the comment she says you know I don't like the term codependent I think that is a loaded term I would agree with you um I think every label can be lauded to everyone. Yeah, I think yeah. maybe in, t- in understanding this, it it's maybe more um, to back it up a little bit and just talk about it in terms of being off balance is more of an, if we're being an overgiver or if we're being an overtaker and either way, when we're off balance, we're off balance and it's a problem. And so finding that middle ground where we're able to get our wants and needs met and we're able to in a healthy way, meet the wants and needs of other people, you know, and finding that balance. So we're not sinking ourselves to save other people. Um, But, you know, Agatha, you make a great point about spirituality and um, how a lot of people can, uh, you know, it can really get a person off track. And, Mm -hmm. you know, and I think there's challenges with any, um, with any practice. I mean, I know for me, what really saved my life when I was going through everything was the book, The Power of Now. And it was very much a mindfulness-based book. And that was my first experience with the concepts of making the present moment your friend. 
basically, mm-hmm. like accepting what was. Because at that time, my mind, I just had so much anxiety. I felt like I could just wanted to crawl out of my skin. And I was either really anxious or I was completely numb and shut down. And I was terrified of the future. Like every part, like the past was was stressful. The future was stressful. My present moment was stressful. Like I, everything was just stressful. And, um, and I found myself thinking like waiting to live my life basically like, well, I'll just wait until think my circumstances are different in order to feel different. And, and I know I've mentioned, let me grab it real quick. I know I've mentioned this before. I used to have it up in the back, but I called it my little Buddha board. Hold on. And this was something that I had written and put in my sunroom at the time. That was the first, it was what I saw every single day. And it was a bunch of sayings that I wanted to really embrace in order to make as much peace as I could with the the present moment. And um, it was basically, you know, being in the now, living an authentic life, Uh, slowing down and doing less and really making the present moment my friend. And that was such a difficult thing to do because the present moment didn't feel like my friend. And, but when I kind of set my intention to, well, how could I make the present moment my friend? That really was a powerful shift in my thinking because then it made me realize, okay, there's like, what is like, what can I make peace with in this moment? And gratitude was a huge part of my practice during that. It still is, but it really definitely was at that time of reminding and it was pulling me back into the moment of what is everything that's good and right about Mm -hmm. my life as it is right now, instead of waiting to start living my life someday when everything fell into place. So Uh, it's funny. I did not make Buddha board, but I wrote like, things that God says I am like who God says I am so basically I was making peace with my identity as as a child of God mm-hmm. <laughs> and one of the major things that I had to really make peace with like that was my first step is that I don't have to do anything to be loved by him like I'm already loved the way I am just him giving me life it's enough for me to be loved by him and because like I was you know re- being raised by you know our parents, imperfect parents, we always feel like we have to do something to be loved. We have to be those good kids and, you know, and it doesn't matter how much we do, we still don't get that love, you know, many times, you know, and so many people get abused or neglect. So for me, that was like the worst part of my process to get that it doesn't matter. Like I don't, I, there's, there's nothing I can do to be more loved. It just, I am loved right now the way I am. So I remember it was crazy because one time I took a marker and I put it on my arm. <laughs> So I woke up in the morning is the first thing I saw. Like I am loved just the way I am. (laughs) Just stuff Mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. So it's crazy. But it's, it's, I think the the biggest idea here, and that's the common ground between those two approaches, is that we need to make peace with who we really are in whatever set of beliefs we have. Mm Mm-hmm. That's like the, the first step. And, you know, especially if you are a survivor of abusive relationship where your identity, you know, after psychological abuse, when you're like you're being wrapped over your identity at the end of the day, you don't know who you are because you feel like you had to be everything somebody else has wanted you to be. So it's important for you to get, you know, this like get, accept the reality because that's just our thinking. The reality is still that you are worth of love and you have a meaning on this world and your life values like that's the reality of who you are but we just like so disconnected from it so we have to like go back to that reality and whether it is you know through through gratitude or prayer or like different meditations there is a way back to that Mm -hmm. so that's what i love about us reading all the different books because they all really address the same thing in all the different ways so if one book didn't work for you this will work or another one like one of those books will work for someone always Mm -hmm. yeah i think there's so much power in um not even so much power i think it's such a vital component if not like the whole goal in healing is to reconnect with our authentic self and to love what we find 
the true refuge, right? So I love, I mean, mm-hmm. I don't call it true refuge, but I call it, I am my safe space. Like I had to become my own safe space. Mm, I love that. And I feel like, I don't remember what I was like, was like, if you don't, it's like you are your own enemy. And I remember that through the abuse, I turned into my own enemy. Because after the, we, we wrote about it uh, in the book we're working on, Dana, when, um, when I said that I felt like I was still in chain of abuse after the abuse ended, because it was almost like I was abusive myself. Like I was my own enemy. I was so used to being my street dad. Yes. That, yeah, I think and- that's such a big um, aha. Like a, it's just such a powerful aha moment. I think there's been mm-hmm. so many of us that have realized that with great horror of, yes. oh my goodness, I did not even realize. I just, you know, was driving myself so hard and, and, and feeling like, well, all of this pressure I was putting on myself here I am. I just took over. I just took over the reins of being critical and demanding and difficult and pushing myself beyond anything that I would ever, I would never have these expectations for another person because they're not reasonable, Mm -hmm. but yet I I do for myself. And it's, this is these, this old programming that I still need to work through. And I mean, it makes me want to cry even thinking about it when, you know, you have these realizations and you just think, oh my goodness, I, I, I really just need to make, make friends with myself and to what it, what it truly means to treat yourself with loving kindness. And, and I think it can also be so difficult, especially if our negative self-talk isn't like, like, for example, with, for me, it's not, it's, it really is, it's very quiet. And I tend, if I do start hearing it, I tend to stop it right away and I'll replace it with something positive. Mm-hmm. You know, so if I'm really getting down on myself, like, oh, Dana, this is so, I can't believe your desk is so messy. And, you know, are you ever, <laughs> gonna, you know, are you ever going to get it together and stuff like that? I'll stop myself and just say, you know what, you've had a lot going on lately and you can do this. And this doesn't mean anything other than your desk is really messy and that you need mm-hmm. to take some time to do it. It doesn't mean it's not a, commentary on you as a human being or you as an adult or your capabilities it just means that your desk is messy and that you've had a lot going on and it's time to slow down and regroup yeah but you it also means like you can you can empower yourself to do the things that actually you want to do in a moment right right like it's okay like because I like sometimes like I have a I I mean I don't have lots of messy things to be honest with you because I'm lit out but it's like let's say like working on one of the chapters, like sometimes like I was like, okay, how, no, actually working out, like some, like I love working, I love running. So at the end of the day, sometimes I'm really tired and I will have the voice like, oh my gosh, you're such a loser. You don't go for a run. Mm -hmm. Right. And then, so I got to respond to it. Like, Hey, first of all, like, you know, like you can use the rain. So like, do I didn't go for a run, right? And you like when you investigate it, like you you will get that will be the investigation part. You get present to that. Oh my gosh, I'm such a loser. But then I can I un- identify myself with that thought, right? So that's when you get this little distance over here, and then you can actually decide from the new place. Like, wait, do I want to go for a run? Do I not want to go for a run? Can I go run for a run tomorrow morning? Would would I prefer to read a book now? I had a long day. Maybe I want to take a bath. Like, but you 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 can you can choose. So the whole point of view is to choose what you want to do next, not just respond to that critical, whatever you want to call it, and you know react to it like a good soldier because <laughs> that's what we used to do basically. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah, it's interesting realizing, like recognizing all of the different ways that anxiety and depression can surface. And that I think more often than not, it's not just chemical, that there's unresolved, there's subconscious things that are going on within us that are bubbling to the surface, but it's so uncomfortable that we're trying to repress it and or change it because it's, mm-hmm. it's inconvenient and nobody want nobody w- likes feeling bad, you know? Oh God. Like, remember that shame question, like how it's the bubbling for me? So uh-huh. I've been like, working with shame like for like months now. And I swear, I was just like, no, 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 no. 
it was just like this. This was like, why someone asked me this question? <laughs> just like, but yeah, it's like it's you do. I think that's what's really important in healing is that you need to become like a true refuge for yourself, like this really safe safe ground for yourself because that's the only place when the healing can happen, and then you can basically experience and you know feel any kind of emotion you know whether it's a repressed shame or anger or whatever or hate or or anything but you will be able to feel it because you got yourself like you got yourself so you know like and like especially like in this context you got yourself in for me it's like you know because i'm a christian so for me it's like i'm here with jesus like so he's my holy ground too so i got it like double way for me but like even if you don't have that and you're just like practicing just straight you know forward mindfulness you got this because you can become your own safe space so do you want to talk more about what she describes as a true refuge and sure. what's the future is because i think that was that was really great for us survivors that, I, I agree i think that was a powerful thing so as i was reading the book i kept it was so funny um it was right as I came across this part in the audiobook today. So I was like, well, what does she mean by true refuge? And then like the next sentence was, here's what I mean by true refuge. <laughs> uh, so oh my God, that's very convenient. Thank you, Tara. Um, but she talks about true refuge is basically connecting with our true self and being able to feel safe within that self. So just what you were saying, Agatha, about you know, we are our own safe space and, yeah. um, and we find true refuge through the, the practice of RAIN, that acronym that she came up with, the recognizing what is happening, allowing life to be what it is, investigating inner experience with kindness, and then that non-identification and non-judgment. And she said the false refuge, which is, this is the path of least resistance, and this is the path that so many of us fall into because it's that instant gratification of, so a false refuge is things that we use to soothe ourselves in the moment. It's food, sex, spending money, drinking, drugs, numbing out, watching t- too much TV, busyness. And busyness for me. Oh, yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. And realizing like when we do, when we can truly become our own best friend, uh, and find true refuge within ourself and realize that 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 healthy adult self mm-hmm. can protect, I guess another way to look at it, right, is the healthy I adult just, self. I just wanted to say that you don't have to practice both as or like just stay with her program and do the rain thing to get to the true refuge because it's the process of reparenting yourself too. Yes. yes. Your back. There was another um, reparenting yourself. What else gets you there? Just a couple ways gets you there. I think it's the awareness of what place we're operating from. Like, I, and I forget where oh, I dealing with the inner critic, but that's also instead of reparenting. I think there was one more thing I was reading about, but I forgot what was it. Sorry. I, for me, it was being aware of, am I, who is steering the ship right now? Is it the wounded inner child or is it my kind of my healthy adult self? Or is it my like rebellious teenage self like who's in charge at this moment and and being bringing a level of acceptance to that so not fighting it so not approaching it as oh no I failed again because my wounded inner child is steering the ship and when am I ever going to get this down and how how am I ever going to help other people if I can't get this like stopping all of that and realizing okay the wounded inner child is showing up. So what messages does it have? And where like, where did this pain come from? And how can I bring self-compassion and self-love to this pain? Because that's when, that's the way that we release it. And then so, the reparenting of ourselves. So then it's that healthy adult saying like, I'm here now. I know how to take care of you. That pain that you experienced was way back when. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to do my very best to make sure that that doesn't happen to you again. And if it does happen to you, we're going to make it okay. And even if now, like, cause it doesn't have to be like you're dealing with the one to try from the, you know, past, like mm-hmm. something could just happen now. Like you taking that stand for yourself, you can start becoming your safe space. People here say they in each other, they don't feel safe. And that some of them, they don't feel like there is a safe space within them. 
I, I just want to address that. Like that's like one of the things is you cannot create i mean you probably can create a safe space within you even even in unsafe circumstances but that would be like doubling or tripling your efforts and i i mean what sense it makes it doesn't matter how safe you would feel inside of yourself if you can die or be hurt so don't do that like first step is always be in an actual safe space right Mm -hmm. like you i i yeah i i'm serious like that's the most important part and then second if you are still dealing with, I mean, full-blown complex PTSD, there's no freaking way you're going to be a safe space. <laughs> I mean, just like, God help me. <laughs> like, I don't remember that was possible for me. So, you know, it takes time to, to heal a little, like, I think there's so many different levels of healing. And it's like, first, you just have to like care for yourself. And then at some point, you start getting to know yourself again as that person you're supposed to be. And and that will be a process. And first, you may not love yourself at all. You may just maybe like two things about yourself or one thing about yourself, but you just build on it. You're just basically choosing to be on your side. Mm-hmm. That's it. Like you're just choosing to be on your side. That's like the best way I can say it. So even if you're not a spiritual person, but like you, 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 you make a decision. You can make this decision today, even if you are still in an abusive relationship that I am on my side and I'm going to fight for myself. And this is how you start claiming that safe space in you because you are, you, you got yourself basically, you start fighting for yourself. So, and then feeling like she actually deals with fear and you know, in all the different books we, we read, like you have to deal with fear too, but that doesn't mean you cannot have your back inside of that fear. I don't know. It like makes sense. It having it makes sense. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I agree. Like you said, people were in the chatter talking about, uh, yeah. you know, not feeling safe within themselves and feeling, you know, this uh, loss of who they were before. And, um, you know, one gal had said that she was feeling, uh, you know, her old self was really happy and bubbly, and now it's kind of that's just gone and this was a conversation I was having with somebody the other day that um it was kind of a little bit off topic but it's relevant to this you know there's as far as attachment styles go it's basically you know you have secure attachment you have um anxious you have avoidant and then you have anxious and avoidant and then you have disorganized and I was telling this person I said you know I really feel that what's missing here is that there's another type of attachment and I refer to that type of attachment as mature. Yes. So here's where I'm going with this. So secure attachment is, it's kind of, it's all dumb luck, right? We're just born into the family that we're born into and you know, you don't choose that. And no, wait, the, this whole theory of attachment was just for the children basically. And then it progresses into the, so that's why there was no mature attachment because as a child, you are not capable of developing Correct. mature attachment. Correct. Correct. Okay. But I strongly believe that our attachment style, we have our primary attachment, what, what we're born, parents. what we're <laughs> raised with, right? Like there yeah. are original attachment to our primary caregivers, mm-hmm. but our attachment style can change based on other significant relationships that we have with other people. Mm-hmm. Um, but one of the things that I've noticed within myself and within so many other survivors is we mourn the loss of some degree of that secure attachment. So people that are feeling safe and secure, they are, they're able to be open to new experiences and somewhat spontaneous, and they're able to laugh and engage in life and be in the present moment. And there's not this fear. Mm-hmm. And however, And I think that the way that we can get back to that is through cultivating a mature attachment style, which I believe is on the other side of pain. It's, it's a big part of, to me, for me personally, I believe it's a big part of becoming completely emotionally mature. Yes. And so it's that conscious decision of, you know what, it's really easy to love life when you don't know pain. Yeah, but it's, I like when you're going with that, because I, I feel like 
many times we want to attach to people just with the idea that they will never, ever, ever hurt us. But the truth is that in regular relationship, people will hurt each other in small ways, bigger ways. You know, we disappoint each other, frustrate each other. And we mm. don't want to attach with that idea at all. Right. So yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. And so my whole theory is this more of a mature attachment style to others is realizing seeing things with the knowledge and the awareness that we have of life is not fair. And there are uh, Mm -hmm. painful events out there and it doesn't matter how good of a person you are, that bad things sometimes happen to good people Mm -hmm. and realizing this and then still making the conscious decision of I'm still going to live a really, I'm going to live a great life. Mm -hmm in spite of life not being fair and bad things happening to good people. I'm making that conscious decision to choose to live, to live a great life. Yeah. But that's, that's also inside of the accepting that this is the way life is because we can, we can spend the rest of our life fighting with how life is and trying to make it to be fair because we believe in this idea that life should be fair. Yes. But that's not true. Nowhere, there's nowhere in the universe one piece of writing when it says life should be fair. Like it was designed to be fair. I know. I mean, tigers eat little deer. How fair is that? Right. And that's nature. So, so, like, no, there's no fairness in biology anywhere. But I think a lot of that, a lot of the mindset of, um, you know, uh, we should be able to get back what we put out is also definitely more of an overgiver type mindset. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that comes from feeling like we can somehow earn love that we can earn being treated appropriately. And so I, I remember vividly feeling really angry and bitter and jaded and jilted at life because I was like, you know what, my whole life has been dedicated to helping other people. I I feel like I continually try to do the right thing. And this is this, like, I feel like evil, the the evil actions that were done to me, like they're winning. What consequences do they have? It's, it's, you know, it's not right and it's not fair. And that was my first real experience with fully understanding. um, That's not going to be fair. But I can't earn that. I can't earn it. And it doesn't matter how many good deeds you do. Things are still going to happen. And, but like I said, the the cool part is realizing we don't need to wait for our circumstances to all become beautiful in order for us to feel peace, you know? See, that's for me was accepting my identity as child of God, because that's exactly what it got me. Like there's nothing I can do to deserve anything good happen to me. No, it's just, I am the way I am and I was made this way and I'm going to be the way I am, you know, like that. Mm-hmm. And, and things, life's going to happen. Like good thing, bad thing, but I know that that doesn't change my worth as who I am. So mm-hmm. and I can still love and be loved and have a great life and deal with things as they yeah. come. I Someone said in a chat here how, you know, something sounded like spiritual lies. So I think when we, because I did have this form of this book, I think Bonnie said something, oh, that sounds like just spiritual lies, like what I am, it's not safe and stuff like that. Um, I think this is very valid because I remember when I was surviving still, not driving, when people were telling me about certain things, like, oh, you just believe everything will be fine. I felt like they are in completely different world and everything they were saying was very like, detached from my reality basically (laughs) you know what I'm saying right so I think it's important to know that to be your own safe space it doesn't have to be spiritual practice like really at all like at all it can be just really you fighting for your life or like every day making small choices to to make your life to be better to make your life to be about what you want and um Gosh, you were saying something about accepting the life for how it is, how, you know, like it's, it doesn't mean that you are agreeing with it and accepting, like, that doesn't mean that you just take from life what it gives you. Like, you don't have to be this, like, 
enlightened spiritual being that is just okay with people spit in your face this is not what we are saying because <laughs> that's not you know that's not what it is it's literally just like you know being realistic that life is life like actually here's remember i did i told you i did landmark which uh-huh. i have to mention here a lot because i don't really like them that much anymore but one of the things i heard there for the because everyone says like oh life is beautiful amazing and i remember there was the first place when i heard life is dangerous like life is dangerous Mm -hmm. and no one makes it alive (laughs) and that hit me like i remember i had such an aha moment i'm like oh my god life is freaking dangerous like seriously People are dangerous. Dating is dangerous. Driving a car is dangerous. <laughs> Climbing mountain is dangerous. Giving a birth to a baby is dangerous. Everything is freaking dangerous because guess what? Every day of your life you can die. Like that's true. Like every day of your life you can die. So life is not beautiful butterflies, clouds in the sky, this like beautiful poetic concept. No, life is actually dangerous. And that hit me like really, really hard. But that also gave me a strong access to reality because that's reality. And that also like, you know, it can disempower you completely, but it can also empower you. And for me, it was empowering because I was like, I get to make choices and take actions knowing that's dangerous. So I'm in a reality. Before I was trying to make it happen, thinking everything will be great all the time. So I was in this naive naive state. Mm -hmm very much disconnected and every time when I did the right thing and it didn't work I was like oh my god why you know it was it was just so heartbreaking each time very very heartbreaking and then it was just like every time you take like every time I'm taking actions to fulfill on some dream I know it cannot happen and I know I can make it happen but there are always there's always risk with it and there is always a risk of I'm gonna fail big time Mm -hmm. I'm going to lose money. I'm going to lose friends, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, so it's dangerous in every way, emotional, physical, whatever. So life isn't really like we are spiritual beings with physical bodies and that physical bodies are a danger all the time. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. And I think for a lot of people that, uh, you know, struggle with this chronic fear of, um, you know, that life is dangerous I think it's worth kind of noting that, um, yeah, that there can be a lot of fear associated with dying, you know, or being hurt. But I think, I guess the way that I look at it, it's more, I'm less afraid of dying or being hurt because that's inevitable. You know, none of us get out of here alive, right? None of us, no. (laughs) my, My bigger fear is, is not having lived. Yes. And so I, Yes, there's certain things that scare me, but I, I, the bigger fear is not experiencing those things. But the funny thing is that fear is also very unrealistic because you have lived. Mm-hmm. Well, but that fear can start just wrapping around you like a boa constrictor to the point where you know you don't want to leave the house because it's you're afraid of driving, you're afraid of other people, you're afraid of this, you're afraid of that. But I think when you can make yourself a a, a safe place and realize, you know what, you set the pace. Yeah. If, in, in, if something's uncomfortable for you, you can either get physical distance or you can assert yourself or you can do some combination of both that you have so much more power over yourself and over your environment and mm-hmm. that there's multiple ways that you can go about keeping yourself safe. And from this point forward with this new level of insight and awareness that you have and and just realizing that because before when we were abused, we have to realize that was the old us. This was our old mindset, our, our old way of viewing other people and the world and our boundaries and standards and deal breakers and everything. And we're not that same person today. Yeah. But also I think you have, we have to give ourselves grace because I'm, mm-hmm. I'm going to share Like I don't drive. I'm afraid of driving. When I'm sitting next to my daughter driving, I'm just praying to Jesus and IRA. I hate driving. I don't know how people can, for me, it's like the most stressful thing ever. And I give up. Like I can literally, if I sit behind a car wheel, I'm going to have a panic attack most of the time. So I don't do that. Now that doesn't mean I cannot have a great life. Some fears, Mm -hmm. it's okay to accept them. And you can, like, I make peace with that. My brain is wired that way. I love painting. I'm good at painting. I'm 
I literally, it's not that I'm just afraid of driving. I suck at driving. Like I can't stay in a line. Like that's why I'm so afraid of it because I can't ever, ever stay in a freaking line. I, I'm like, I'm not going to even talk more about it because that's very, very uh, embarrassing. But some of us, we may have some fears and it's okay to have fears. You know, sometimes like, I love, I mean, it's, it sounds great when you put it on the wall. Oh, you have to push through the fear. The freedom is on the other side of that fear. It applies, but not all the time in every circumstances for everyone. And especially if you are a survivor, as, you know, especially like, oh, just go on that date, you know, go out with this guy. No, if you fear something, do not push through that fear. Stay the freaking home. <laughs> Get safe. And you know what? It's okay to be afraid of certain things because fear is good in certain circumstances. Yeah. And then, you know, in order, like, if you really have a dream and you want to, you know, then it's worth for you to push to that fear. You can do that. But it's all your freaking choice. It's not your neighbor choice, your mother choice, your daughter. It's your choice. Some fears are pushed through. Some fears I will not. And that's okay. Yeah. And I think, you know, also finding that middle ground of, okay, how do I not let this fear negatively impact my life like how do I how can I kind of manage that so like you were saying that you're afraid of driving but I have a driver I use you have a driver so it doesn't it doesn't no I have have my business I still go to work I do my art shows everything and you can you can do it but it's but I had to accept it too okay this is my reality I don't I won't be driving yep and now I can give up, sit home. Oh, I can't go to the store because I can't drive. Or I can have a great relationship with my friends, figure out my shopping on the way home. You know, just it, you have to be creative. So the fear does not need to stop you. Sometimes you have to go around it. And I think it's that it's, I just really want to put it out there because survivors, we have so many fears. And some of those fears, you know, I'm not saying that um, my mother actually started driving after she was 50. So maybe mm-hmm. this will happen to me. I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? I have 10 more years. But, um, you know, as survivors, we have fears. And some of the fears, we will be able to push through them at different levels in our healing. And if you're not there, don't be there. Don't, like, like because then you can really break yourself by trying to make yourself stronger. And you can do yes. that. That doesn't make sense. It's like going to the gym and working out without making sure you have balance and flexibility and nourishment. You can break yourself. Don't break yourself. So These are all very valid points and I agree completely. And we should write about that somewhere because it. I, I don't think that's a topic that's addressed enough when it comes to survivors. And it's yet again, one of those other messages that if we're seeing it we just need to have a, a different set of filters. I think when we interpret these messages that are, that it's in a more empowered um, understanding because that, like you said, the normal, the quote unquote normal approach is to be like, yeah, you know, living life is on the other side of the sphere and you got to push through it. But for so many survivors, they're terrified. They get the wrong message. They're terrified to date. And so then they push themselves to date and then boom, they wind up in another abusive relationship yes. or, something happens and it's because they don't have those foundational skills of knowing how to keep themselves safe and realizing what kind of power that they hold with setting the pace and um you know just controlling the speed of things yeah i think this is why important is to whatever way works for you but you need to find some some way to be mindful and aware and you know to know yourself deeply because it's like we need to know we have limits we are humans and Mm -hmm. i know and it's so crazy because i feel like the world around us almost like acts like we have no limits Mm -hmm. like like those was like everything possible limitless unstoppable are such a huge word and they are everywhere now but that's just marketing that's just like this dream of all of us to be those wonder people whatever successful you know like all those big words this is just marketing to sell us more shit basically (laughs) but our brain takes it all literally and then we try to live like that and that's not who we are we are humans we have limits Mm -hmm. we're not limitless we have limits i start and i end 
I get tired. I need to go to sleep. I cannot go a week without sleeping every night. I will die. <laughs> I have to eat and drink water. I will die. Yeah. So it's, it's so crazy. But like we live like we don't have limits anymore. And we do. And as survivors, it's even more important for us to, to know our limits because we are more sensitive and we are more vulnerable in certain situations. So Yes. Yes, I agree. There's a couple of things I wanted to say. Um, Martha in the chat had mentioned, she says, oh, I love that. I want to choose to live a great life. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to add, making that decision for me was an absolute game changer. And there were two experiences, I think I've shared this before, but just in case people are new here, that really reinforced this to me. One was I had gone to Thanksgiving dinner with some family that I had never met before. Um, that's a whole nother story, but these people I'd never met before, I didn't even know they existed. They ended up coming over for Thanksgiving. They were older, they were in their late eighties and there were two sisters and they were talking about this experience and they were angry and hurt. And I, my cousin and I, we had never met them before. We were both thinking that whatever, when we walk in mid conversation, whatever had happened was recent. And then we realize, oh my gosh, no, what had happened was back when they were children. <laughs> and, and it was a very valid, like their pain was very valid. Their mom had died and their dad couldn't, they had like four kids in their family and he couldn't afford to feed and clothe them. And so he gave up two of the girls for adoption and um, they lived in an orphanage. They had a hard life. But anyways, the thought of that pain, that was the first time I'd seen a person be in so much emotional pain from something that had happened like 75 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it terrified me. And I thought, oh my gosh, I don't want to be like that. And that's exactly where I was feeling in my life because what had happened to me had happened a few years earlier yeah. and it was still like it happened yesterday. Mm -hmm. That was one moment. And then the second one was my reading my grandmother's book and realizing everything she'd gone through with my grandfather, who was a narcissist and a pathological liar and cheater and just the hell that she went through with him. And knowing she was such a beautiful, kind soul, like if you were to have met her, you would have never thought that she'd ever experienced an ounce of pain in her whole life. Because she she's just was to be beautiful and loving person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And realizing, oh my gosh, she yeah. didn't she just wasn't born that way. She chose to keep that part about her and to, and to become even more compassionate and kinder after such a yeah. horrible experience um, that lasted decades. And I thought, oh my gosh, I have the power to choose. Yes. I don't need to be forever broken by this. Mm -hmm. I can choose to have, and here's the beauty in this. I think when we, when we know the outcome, Yes. We see the journey. I mean, we can see the outcome so easily. Look at the narcissist in your life. He is the outcome of being a bitter, shitty, whatever people just giving up on being humans. And I think they just produce more of those. Well, I think what's important here is that when you know the outcome, so when you set the intention of I am going to live a great mm -hmm. life, you mm -hmm. know the outcome. When you know the outcome, you see the journey. So then you start seeing step by step what steps you need to take in order mm -hmm. to make that outcome a reality. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I was trying to say, like, when I saw uh, certain people, you know, around me, I was, I said to myself, I will never want to be like you. And mm -hmm. that's like the life of bitterness, the life of plotting against someone else's, the life of you know, trying to be happy at the cost of someone else's unhappiness. That's the kind of life. And the outcome of it is you are a lonely, yucky woman at the end. And I don't want that ever for anyone. So you, what, and I think each of us, we can see both. We can see a very wonderful people around us and very ugly people. And if it's very simple to see the difference between them, it's in their action often. People are choosing every day to be kind and nice and loving and I don't know. That's for me it was terrifying experience to see bad people and good people and, you know, see the difference. Yeah. Pain, you know, pain and trauma can, it's just like toxic quicksand and yeah. it's, nobody wants to be stuck in it, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's the unfortunate thing is 
it's so easy for us to get stuck in it and not even realize it until we're up to our necks in it. And it's so important. Another big turning point for me that really helped was, so once I realized, okay, now that I know the outcome, that I'm going to have a great life, Mm -hmm. I can start seeing the journey and I can start taking daily steps to Mm -hmm. make the outcome happen. Mm -hmm. And you guys have probably heard me talk about this, but getting clear on, okay, what is a good life for me? And a good life is, it's living a life of, um, uh, is being organized. It's living a life of service. It's living a life of uh, being good to myself, of embracing healthy new experiences. And so I would do little things like I would clean out a junk drawer. That was one step closer to the outcome that I knew was possible. I was going to go to, I would go to the gym. I would call up a friend and invite them out for lunch. I would do all of these little things. And that was the way that I got my quote unquote revenge you know, yes. I funneled my energy into all of these positive things that enhanced my life. Because if we don't, it's so easy for that quicksand to just grab you by the ankles and start pulling because it's understandable that you're angry and that you're hurt and it's not fair and you can feel stuck there. It's understandable. I, I totally get it. I think we all totally get it. But that's where the fighting has to come in. And we fight with it, acts of love to ourselves and to other yeah. people. That's what I want to say. But because uh, I kind of feel like if you just focus on yourself, you you can you may become bitter. I, I kind of feel that. But also, I feel that focusing on a big life as one is too overwhelming for survivors, especially at the beginning. So I would say, what do you want to do to have this day be great? Just focus mm-hmm. on the day. And I remember I would create my days and then my weeks. And then all that together, like then you have a history of like months when you actually are doing something for, you know, that takes you forward, not back. And then you can focus on the life because you kind of get the strength. But the very, very beginning, I don't remember I was capable of saying I want to have a good life. I just wanted to have one good day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, and I think that's where you start. Mm-hmm. And um, Wonder Woman said something here. She's afraid of rejection and, and stuff like this. It just occurs something to me. Um, I've been saying something because, you know, like we deal with different things often. So I was dealing with shame. One of the things I was like saying to myself, like, you can call it mantra. I don't call it mantra. I was just like, I communicate with myself because, you know, we think, we talk to ourselves all the time. So why not out loud? So I would say to myself, I want me. I want me. You are unwanted. I want me. I really want me. And I think that's really identify for me that shame and a fear of rejection. As it's not really out there, it's inside here because I didn't want myself for a very, very long time. Like I had this identity of I am unwanted, you know, and like, because I'm not good enough or like, you know, so I want me. And when you want yourself, this is like, you are accepting yourself. I think in this book, if you want to go back for a moment, just quickly, Mm -hmm. there was a woman whose husband was dying and there was nothing they could do. He was just going to die. And you know, first she was like bitter and fighting with it. But then at some point she just like, I, she started saying, I permit, like I allow it. Mm -hmm. Like I accept it. I allow it because she was going to die. So that helped her literally. So, you know, you, you can't say I want it, but because it's like crazy to say I want it, but she was like, I'm allowing it. I'm permitting it. And it's almost at the end, she was welcoming it. And it was such a transformation for her because she was welcoming that as a reality. And because she did that, she was able to be with her husband through it to the end Mm -hmm. in a very like positive, loving, kind way for herself and him. If she would be fighting it, it it would be just terrible for both of them, basically. Um, But I think it's the same here. When we can start allowing ourselves and wanting out, it's just it's the same idea of this very radical acceptance of what's happening. That you need to want yourself, you need to want your life, you need to want, you know, allow what's happening. And there is no other way. And you know, whether you use Christianity or Buddhist or any other religion to to find that peaceful place about it, you need to do that. And then um, nothing like we said here before. 
that someone is married right now happily and have two children doesn't mean they are a better person than you are. That doesn't mean that. Mm -hmm. And you don't know if they are that happy. <laughs> That's another story. <laughs> so it's like, I, I just was looking at people in the chat talking about stuff. Like, you know, it's hard to understand. I don't understand why I'm just like, I'm great. I don't know why I don't have a great husband, but I can spend, you know, the next couple hours wondering what's wrong with me. And that's going to make me feel bad. Or I can spend the next couple hours thinking like, okay, what I'm going to do now? Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Yeah. And Wonder Woman had mentioned too about, uh, there's two things that she mentioned that I wanted to address. You mentioned one of them that uh, she says, I fear dating. I can't handle rejection again. Yeah. This, this realizing um, where we're getting our self-esteem from is a very important part of healing because we either we're getting our self-esteem from within or we're getting our self-esteem from without. Yeah. And when we're getting our self-esteem from, from outside of ourselves through achievements or advanced degrees or the things that we're doing, we're earning it. But the problem is then it can be taken away. It's all their esteem. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so important that that self-esteem comes from within and yes, rejection is painful. Um, however, but it's important that we keep our self-worth and our hurt feelings in two different buckets. So rejection, hurt feelings, absolutely. That makes sense, but that doesn't need to spill over into your self-worth and it, we don't need to take that on of oh my gosh, there's something profoundly wrong with me and, you know, and, and own that. It's just, you know, life is about, I mean, success is about rejection. It's, um, so you know, the only way to success is failure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you're trying to say, right? Yeah. yeah the yeah. only way. And it's so crazy because I wish we were told that early, early in a childhood that, you know, like this, like when you play something, like when you don't do it well, this people will call it failure, but it's not really failure. You're just, this is just your way to getting better and then you're doing it right. So Yeah, it's the, it's the learning curve. And the beauty yeah. of that is every time something doesn't go the way we'd hoped is then it's a, there's a saying it's sometimes, um, Sometimes, you know, we've heard the saying, sometimes we win, sometimes we lose. Mm -hmm. It's really, uh, this other alternate saying goes, sometimes we win, sometimes we learn. And I think there's so much more value in that because every, everything that doesn't go as planned when we're not winning, when things aren't going our way, there's always lessons there that we can glean yeah. from that. And um, progress. Yep. And then she also made the comment about she's afraid to make important phone calls. So using yeah. the, the author's Tara Brock's premise of rain um, to approach that is that awareness of acknowledging that fear of, you know what, because here, here it is before, before these fears are made known, we might just think, oh, I'm just procrastinating, I'm lazy, I'm unmotivated, what's wrong with me? I because we're we're avoiding, we're avoiding, we're avoiding. Yeah. And so when we're at that stage in awareness, we're not aware that there's actual fear about making a phone call. We just we're like, oh, I just ran out of time today. I guess I'll do it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. We're procrastinating, we're doing all these things, but then deep down we're like, why? finally we realize what is my problem? I keep avoiding these things. And now I've, now the problem gets to the point where we experience enough pain that we've got to do something different, you know? Yeah. Can we say again quickly about rain? Cause people are asking about it. So rain is you recognize. Sure. Rain is an acronym. Mm -hmm. So R stands for recognize what is happening. A stands for allow life to be what it is. I stands for investigate inner experience with kindness and N stands for non-identification or non-judgment. So now that you have this awareness of you recognize what is happening, which is that I'm afraid to make important phone calls. That's huge because now you have, you're recognizing what's happening. You actually see what's the real problem or occurrence or reality of the situation is this way. Well, I, I, I would say it's a start. So yeah. there's that awareness of, I'm afraid to make important phone calls. And then a, the in, in rain 
is allowing life to be what it is. So it's realizing, okay, you know what? I have this fear about important phone calls and that is what it is. Mm-hmm. And the I part of RAIN is investigating that inner experience with kindness. And so investigating that deeper would be, okay, why am I afraid to make important phone calls? Because it's generally, it's our fear is rare, we're rarely afraid of what we think we're afraid of. And so it's, it's not that we're afraid to make important phone calls. It's, it's probably certain types of phone calls mm-hmm. and then what those phone calls what kind of other doors might open because of that. And then what those other doors might mean. So if it's a phone call, you know, to an attorney of, okay, then what if we get bad news? And what if, what if we find out we've got a whole bunch more hurdles to to go through and it's, it's what that phone call could potentially mean to us. That's what we're avoiding and what we're fearing. So investigating that, but approaching it with kindness and so that kindness part of it would be, okay, yes, I, I'm avoiding calling my attorney back because I'm afraid that there's going to be more charges and a bill that I can't comfortably afford to pay and mm-hmm. all of these things. So then being like telling yourself, yes, that's very valid. It's understandable why you would fear that. That's, you know, that's a, that's a lot to take on. And, and being kind to yourself of look at how far you've come and look at, look at how much, you know, you're a warrior. You've been going to battle every day and it's okay. It's okay to feel, to have a mix of feelings with this Mm -hmm. and to give yourself self-compassion. And then the non-identification part of it would be uh, realizing that what you're, what you're thinking and what you're feeling and even what you're doing, like avoiding these phone calls, this doesn't change who you are. This, this is, this is what you're experiencing in this moment, but it doesn't diminish your worth as a human being. And there's still so much that is right about you, but this, this problem is surfacing because there's deeper stuff there. But she also remember how she says like, and I think that's the mindfulness comes in that those are just thoughts and they not really reality. And that's the very important part. Cause like, it's almost like, you have a brain and your brain will be thinking thoughts regardless of you. It's like mm-hmm. raining. That's why I love she did the rain because I always feel like thoughts are like rain, like weather, like it's cloudy with chance for meatballs or whatever it is that day. And it's just your brain, but that doesn't need to, you know, end up in meatballs at the end of the day. It's like, so you get, you can un- identify yourself with that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and you can choose to take, make that phone call or n- not today, the next day, but you can choose to, you know, face that fear or not. Yep. So. And one of the things that helps me when I get to that place, which is often, um, there's, uh, two approaches. My brother just sent me a YouTube video from, I forget her name, Mel something or other. And she did a Ted talk about this, but her way of getting past fear was to count backwards from five. So basically, because you're not giving yourself room to think and have that fear grow. So if you have an important phone call to make, or if you're going to try to go to the gym, it's five, four, three, two, one, get moving. And that's how I did the zip line. I didn't even, I go three to one, boom. (laughs) Yes. That's what we get. We've got to bypass that part in our brain because when fear takes hold, it seizes it and we can go into freeze. I knew myself. I'm like, I'm going to mm-hmm. just end up hugging the thing and I will not move. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So that's powerful. And then another strategy I use is setting a timer. So setting a timer for 15 minutes and then focusing on. So if let's say for example, which is very common with depression or anxiety, somebody's house is an absolute mess and they feel a lot of shame and embarrassment about that. They're overwhelmed. Setting a timer and being like, okay, I'm going to just hit my desk or I'm going to go get all the dishes done. And it's kind of fun because then you're making it into a game and it's not that you have to clean the whole house. You're chunking it down into these doable tasks and that helps to build momentum. That's funny because that's how my um, 
to-do list look like. I just sprint in between little things because I know I'm more like, it's almost funny because I'm like picturing myself being like a little busy bee. <laughs> but when I do little things here, 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 it all adds up. Yep. Mm-hmm. One more thing I, I think is great about, you know, fear of an anxiety is that it's, you know, and I think that that RAIN um, acronym, that, that whole process can help with that too. Mm-hmm. Which is really, really awesome because I think in that uh, investigation, you will get present to it. So many times we get paralyzed because we have an anxiety, but when we start actually, and it, I don't think that should be the first thing you start to use RAIN for maybe like later on when you practice it for a while. But I think um, when you start looking, you know, using it for an anxiety, you will see that anxiety is a bunch of unanswered questions. And you're just asking, 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 asking. It's just a bunch of questions. And it's really crazy. But the moment you start investigating and the moment you will answer one of two of those questions, the whole thing like kind of lifts up. It's really funny. Like Mm -hmm. I, I... my therapist told me something like this because I said to him, like, I'm very anxious about, I don't remember, something something about going on a date. He's like, well, what questions are you having? I'm like, what do you mean questions? I don't have any questions. I'm just anxious. He's like, no, you probably have questions and you just don't want to answer them. I was like, oh, so, and, and it really did. did. I, I saw that. There was a bunch of questions that I did not want to know answers to, which was really funny. So, yeah, it's interesting when we realize that these emotions, they all carry messages for us. And if we can truly, a big part of making peace with the present moment is realizing that these emotions are coming from within you and Mm -hmm. everything that your brain does is for your highest and greatest good, even though it doesn't feel like it, especially during times like this, when it's giving all, you know, nightmares and anxiety and all of this. But all of these unpleasant emotions, they're not bad or good. They're just pleasant or unpleasant. And they all carry messages for you. And so if you can dig out the message, oftentimes the emotion, especially the unpleasant ones, then disappear because its purpose has been served. But it's difficult to try to do that because it's painful in that moment. It's you know sort of like taking out a splinter. It, you're going to have to dig around a little bit. It's going to be uncomfortable, but it's worth it. So I think -hmm. think in chapter seven, she said something about that. It's the body sensation that creates the emotion. And I was like, this is crazy because the body sensation, like if we really use it inside of, you know, us survivors and not trying to end up in another abusive relationship, your emotion will be given by your gut feeling. Mm-hmm. Like the body sensation, because, you know, like, and this is that really cool thing, because we have to accept that we are in a way animals too, and we will have this gut feeling and that will give us emotion and that will give us thinking later. So we have to be just aware of that. I was thinking that was brilliant because I always felt that emotions are just given by my thoughts, but that's not true. Emotions mm-hmm. are actually given to us by our body sensation. Mm-hmm. I was like, this is good. And I think as, we we are confused because of the complex PTSD or the trauma. That's why we think our emotions are given by our thoughts. And that's why there's this whole disconnect from our body sensation because we just hear. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh my gosh. So this this is like, I think this is, that's why it's so important to like be in the moment. And like, you know, we, we kind of like in our healing, there's lots of like backtracking things back to the source. So like we start from thoughts and the emotion and then we like, okay, how does this feel in my body? So we are backtracking everything. So, so basically it's like we're restoring the right neurological connections, I guess, mm-hmm. of the pathways because that's how it, it went that way. We just didn't see it. <laughs> so I don't know. Mm-hmm. I thought that was great. So, yeah. That was one thing that had so much value to me because I was like, oh, that's why we're doing it. So, yep. Yeah. And here's a comment from Martha who says that she's been in that freeze sleeping mode for a while. She says, I love that 54321. That's a great one. I'm going to try that. When, when I was struggling with that as well, because that's my primary defense as well as sleep. I just go into kind of a collapse, physical collapse, basically when I'm really stressed. But when I was fresh out of my situation with Jack years and years and years ago, I was so completely, completely, oh my gosh, I was so overwhelmed. And 
I wasn't, I just was not taking care of myself at all. And I remember it was, I guess, kind of like my healthy adult self, but it was more of my no nonsense, healthy adult self would come online and would talk to me in third person and kind of like a, almost like a, a drill sergeant who was very no nonsense, but not, not, a, not, a, not mean or abusive, but just very no nonsense of, okay, Dana, it's time to get up. You need to march your body into the shower. So let's go right foot on the ground, left foot on the ground, right foot, left foot, right foot, left foot, get your body in the shower. And I would have to do this often. And it, it helped to get me moving because I literally could not get moving. I just didn't care. I wasn't, I wasn't eating or showering for days on end. I didn't care. And that's, that, that's a, that's a scary place to be. Cause then, you know, you're in that quicksand. I'm so glad I have OCD because I shower, I would shower three times a day on those days. <laughs> be the other way around well and I think it can help when a person has other people around them I had no family and I had no children so yeah. when you've got nobody there to see the slow descent it's mm-hmm. really, really difficult oh, no I would just freeze in the shower I'm just I'm just saying that yeah of my OCD part instead of like not showering in a bed I would just be doing nothing but going to shower like every hour <laughs> so yeah, yeah. It's like another part of crazy <laughs> Yeah, I wish I uh, kind of had more Thank of that. Sort of the, the collapse. Um, so Bonnie said something about how do we get present to that anxiety if it's subconscious? And I feel that this is a very valid question um, because you can, I mean, so it's, it's Bonnie, like if you really look at it, you cannot say it's subconscious because you already know you have an anxiety. So like you are already aware of some of it. And I feel sometimes we say things like, oh, it's sub- I'm subconsciously doing something just because we don't want to look at it. But it's we know it's there. We just don't want to look at it. So it's kind of not really subconscious anymore. And it's, but it's okay because like we want to have this kind of like, I, I guess like defense because it's really, like we don't want to face certain things. So I understand that. But like you are seeing that anxiety. So like the next, I guess, you know, it's taking very slow steps into like bringing it even more into your awareness and just slowly, you know, dealing with that. And, you know, that's that's the only thing I can say. I don't know what else, Dana. You yeah, would say. I would just start asking yourself questions about it. So that's the beauty kind of the flip side to this, that that's the beauty and the purpose of pain and of uncomfortable emotions is they get our attention. Yes. They're like the tip of the iceberg. And so, um, and it can be really difficult to kind of see all the way down and it it can take quite a bit of self-exploration over a lot of time to really figure out how deep this thing really goes. But asking yourself questions about this. So, okay, well, what is making me anxious? And have I ever felt this way before? Or where did this anxiety come from? Or what would it mean? Because the anxiety is normally fear about something. So what is the deeper message of fear in this? And it generally stems back to some type of loss. Yeah, I almost want to take it the other way too, because I feel that it depends what kind of person you are, different things will work for you. Mm-hmm. like for me sometimes when because I'm I tend to overanalyze things so if I start just questioning myself and my anxiety like and just like like just from the beginning all the time without getting grounded in where I am I'm just gonna fly into the anxiety world for like days so I would try to refocus also on my body and how I like on the body sensation because I think that's what's gonna really help to relieve some of that because there was an anxiety as a thinking like that that non-stop war worrisome thinking right those questions and worries and questions but there was also that feeling that comes with it and i think it's important to address that part too so we like it was like more balanced in reality so focus on the body sensations so you can actually feel some of that fear or or worry in your body and that will help relieve some of that and then you can breathe because that's important. It's always breathing. It's, I mean, you know, we'll be dead with our breathing, basically. <laughs> but it's good to be aware of breathing because that's relaxes. The whole point of you breathing in and out and like making it longer, it's also the same thing. It's, it activates your 
it's biology. It's nothing spiritual. It activates your parasympathetic and it slows down your heartbeat. It calms you down. That's the whole thing. So you can just, you know, just, just work through that and know that, I guess, you know, being your self space or the true refuge, one of the other ways is looking at it is that knowing that you can handle it. Like, it, will, it goes back to making yourself that safe space, yeah. right? So recognizing, bringing your healthy adult self into th- that the healthy adult self is steering the ship, not the wounded or scared inner child, but you're realizing, you know what? Hey, I set the pace. And I have, I know what I have control over and I know what I don't have control over. And I know where my boundaries are in this. And I know there's multiple ways that I can keep myself safe. And so when you can get grounded within yourself, it's a lot easier to make peace with the present moment when you've made peace with yourself and Mm -hmm. looking, you're not looking to other people to keep you safe. Mm -hmm. You realize I, this is a responsibility that I own. And this is how I can keep myself safe with physical distance, with asserting myself, with um, excusing myself, with saying I'm busy. There's lots of different ways that you can go about, you know, keeping, keeping yourself safe from people. Bonnie said something here. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm so proud of Bonnie, like seriously, because I, 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 I saw Bonnie in the chat for so many, so many months. And like, it looks like you're really doing some serious work now because you're really focusing on stuff so heads heads off whatever you say that like you are awesome like all of you are awesome but bonnie is really awesome today um you just said bonnie just said that she has a tightness in her jaw and neck and that is great to know as a part of anxiety that's fantastic Mm -hmm. like you know tightening your jaw so one of the things you do is like literally you can massage here there's this thing you can do. You can massage your jaw here. And if you press really, really hard, it's, it's going to hurt. But it's actually going to really, it's like you have trigger points in your jaw. So you can do that. You can actually massage that. And the other thing is neck. You roll your neck, but also you do this. Like we do this a lot. I'm, I'm doing exercises now because I, I deal with all that anxiety in my body. So it's like I, can, I know how to help a little bit. You have to, when you breathe, you have to roll your shoulder back and especially focus when you, take them down like you try to stretch them down all the way and like do it multiple times during the day and that's actually release a lot a lot of anxiety also also this kind of exercise it's Mm -hmm. gonna release here all this area stretch it and this is why i think you know remember body keeps the scar and i think also somebody asked but they said how important it is to really start engaging your body into in body no body keeps us card that's that book you, you have to engage your body your physical into into your emotional health because it's so connected like this all has it i remember i was tightening i was grinding my teeth like i had to mm-hmm. have feeling done because i was breaking my teeth off from anxiety i was grinding my teeth when i was sleeping so i had to do lots of relaxation i also ended up taking muscle relaxer for three nights in a row which helps to break the pattern Mm -hmm. the habit of of grinding your teeth but i just you know i was breaking my own teeth basically from anxiety which is like insane because teeth are the hardest part in your body like like how how much anxiety imagine i had to have to grind my own teeth like grind them off so it's 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 been insane so i i really understand that so yeah, and asking yourself, Bonnie, because she was saying that she's stresses about opening, um, going through mail and doing bills, and then kind of getting curious about that. Okay, well, what is it about going through a lot of mail and doing bills that is stressing you out and that you're finding overwhelming? And and continue kind of going down that rabbit hole. Is there any way that you can? Um, you know, make that process more enjoyable. Perhaps you can turn on some of your favorite music. Perhaps you can set a timer and just do it for 10 minutes. Um, You know, because I I get it. I mean, I, I vividly remember being at that place when I was facing losing a home in foreclosure and facing Mm -hmm. bankruptcy. And I was so 
stressed. And I just, I still come across, this has been like five years now. I still come across mail that I haven't opened from that point. Oh yeah. Sometimes I don't go to the mailbox for a week because I'm just like, okay, I'm too anxious. I'm not going to deal with it today. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'm going to go tomorrow on my way from work when I have a coffee in my hand. So I just like distract myself. But for me, it's funny because I will serve divorce papers in such a crazy way. And it was when I was sitting, you know, like I was getting all the mail and, and then person saw me and they served me the divorce papers. And I sat on the steps and I read and I was like used to being abusive in my divorce papers. And, you know, so just imagine that like, right? Like seriously, like what just happened? So, and that was such a strong feeling that just literally made mail is dangerous in my head so yeah it's like those crazy connections our body forms so i think also realize it's like something that helped me was realizing you know will this matter in six weeks will this matter in six months if if somebody were to read a book of my life what is what is really important and what would i want them to know like i i would want to leave the legacy of oh here's how you know she was able to overcome these, these certain things, like these anxieties and these stressors and, and to continue to move forward. Cause I think we all, it's so easy to get weighted down by this stuff because it is, it's scary when it's Mm -hmm. finances and, oh my goodness, what, what is this going to mean? And where, where will I go and what will I become? And, you know, it's threatens a very core part of our safety and and stability. Um, That's why you have to be on safe space because nothing from outside, like, yeah for me for me too I also had to think about okay what is what is the biggest fear that I'm fearing here so with complete financial devastation which is what I was experiencing it was okay what's worst case scenario okay worst case scenario is I don't pay my bills and then I go into foreclosure worst case scenario is um that I either try to arrange payments with something. I let the house go into foreclosure. Um, that's what it is. I'm not going to go to jail over it. Thankfully, we not, here in the United States, we live in a country where that they don't do that. So I'm not going to go to jail. No, I don't have any hitmen after me. I don't owe the wrong people money. <laughs> I, you know what? I mean, seriously. Like, no, I know. I go always dramatic with my worst case scenario. My worst case scenario is like, what? What's the worst thing? It's like, well, I'm going to die having nothing. I'm just like this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> big deal. <laughs> well, and the reality is you're going to die having nothing. I now, know, right? <laughs> right? You can't take it with you. So, it, but it was, it was very, very stressful and challenging for me. But thinking about, okay, worst case scenario, I guess I fly home and I go, I live with my mom and I get a job and I, I shovel my way out you know? Um, so thinking, sometimes thinking about how you would handle worst case scenario can relieve a lot of the stress Yeah, because then you know, you're going to be fine Mm -hmm. if you have to deal with worst case scenario. You know, what's interesting Hmm. how I think 99% of uh, survivors are like, are people with complex PTSD have actually fear of opening mail. I thought I'm like the only one and I'm like, oh my God, we all do that. (laughs) Well, I think, I think that tends to stem from when we are not financially secure, right? Or there's some, there's something, some message that could really throw our life into a loop. That's why that, that fear of opening mail, but you know, there's certain things that we can do. I'll I'll tell you my experience. It's been an absolute game changer. Mm -hmm. To have at a minimum three months worth of all my expenses in savings. And I'm at the point now where I have a minimum of six months worth of savings. So if something does happen, I'm not I'm not operating at the red line like mm-hmm. I was before, where you're kind of borrowing from Peter to pay Paul kind of a thing. That's a really stressful way to live or, or having to work a job you hate because you're mm-hmm. living paycheck to paycheck. And it took me a while to really get to the place of, I've got to make this emergency fund a top priority. This isn't just a, a fund I dip into when I want to go on vacation. I don't touch that. That's my that's my way of helping myself to feel safe. 
it's emergency fund you have that's yeah yeah that's, yeah 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 that's different but i don't think it's always financial someone says here like for no reason i think there is always a reason like each of us have some kind of reason that triggers us trigger mm-hmm. that feel of opening mail and it doesn't have to be financial it can be um you know being served again by your abusive ex someone about child custodies or whatever you know it is mm-hmm. or getting a letter from your mother or you know whatever it can be it it can be so many things it doesn't have to be financial it can be just personal it mm-hmm. can be government it can be but i think it's it's helpful to realize that yeah. we can also try to make this experience as enjoyable as possible mm-hmm. so um I had a friend of mine back in college. She was the gal I was talking about last night with the orange juice story. If you guys saw that live stream, but anyways, she had this whole life philosophy. If it's not fun, don't do it. And I remember thinking like, well, but you know, there's lots of things in life that aren't fun, but that we have to do. And this, that's not practical and blah, blah, blah. And she's like, no, you can make it fun. fun." Yeah. (laughs) And, and I remember being so blown away by that. And I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Tell me more about this philosophy that you speak of that we can make things fun. And, and so she was like, well, for example, doing dishes, she loved to drink Dr. Pepper and she loved, um, she loved the band Toto. If you, this is, oh my gosh, I'm really dating myself. (laughs) But, but she would turn on Toto or yeah, like yeah. 80s music <laughs> and she would drink a Dr. Pepper and she would knock out the dishes. Yeah. And then I realized, oh my gosh, there's so much in life that we do that we're dragging ourselves through because we're trying to be responsible, but we can make this fun. God, yeah. see, everything can be fun or can be mindful moment. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. See everything in life. Traffic. You can either make it fun, start jamming. Or you can be mindful and meditate every single thing or pray every single thing. Yep. Like, like seriously, it's crazy. It is crazy. Like, and it's so yeah. these little things, they're, they're free, you know? So um, Bonnie was saying, well, maybe I'll listen to great music while I'm going through the Oh my mix. gosh, we should do crazy stuff. Like everyone record yourself dancing when you're opening my and put it on a Facebook. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Like do something fun when you're opening mail this week and put it on the support group in a Facebook. <laughs> Come on, I dare you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the funniest video will get one of my prints. <laughs> or yeah. something. Yeah. There is reward. <laughs> yeah, I like that. <laughs> I like that. We should do that. Be Let's do that. Thing. What the heck? Yeah. Yeah. we only see you know support group like it's a close group so it's safe you can do something silly and funny so it'll be fun mm-hmm. <laughs> and then you can get a nice print if you want to <laughs> and if you win so yeah. <laughs> and if you lose you still had fun by opening your mail <laughs> that's that's right yeah bonnie's laughing at that she says oh my gosh the mail dance LOL. yes 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 and you have to talk mail dance hashtag mail dance <laughs> Yes. Hashtag male dance. And she was saying, and eat ice cream too. That's so funny. Yes. I was thinking ice cream. I think uh, it would be fun to come up with the, the silliest male dance possible. Something that really puts a big smile on your face where it's the most ridiculous thing. I haven't been drinking by the way. I don't drink alcohol at all. I don't need to. Yeah. No, she doesn't. I know her in real life. She's, she's really like this. <laughs> Over. <laughs> I'm overboard sometimes. That's why I'm too loud sometimes because I'm just too joyous. Yeah. But yeah, that'll be fun. And um, I think that will be a false refuge. But if you are a safe refuge for yourself while you do that, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like that. I like that. I can't no. wait to see what people come up with as far as like their ridiculous <laughs> male dances. <laughs> oh my gosh. We're going to have a new hashtag. Yeah, I like that. Well, it's sort of like the saying, you know, um, life isn't about waiting for the storms to pass. It's about learning to dance in the rain. Oh, yeah. That's the guy I dated had it on the wall. That was fun. (laughs) But I think there's so much there's so much truth to that, you know, for waiting for all of our circumstances to become peaceful. In order for us to experience peace, we're going to be waiting a long time. I have a great saying, too. Someone said that. 
who I don't really like anymore, but they heard it from someone else, so it doesn't matter. I don't know who to credit it to originally, but it oh. says like that. Well, if life gives you lemon and you do not like lemonade, go and get some oranges. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what stops you, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, well, I think on that note, let me just wrap up book club yeah. here. A uh, book we're reading next month is called Waking the Tiger by Peter Levine. And uh, it's a very interesting book. I have started listening to it on Audible and I love it. So, and also by the way, Audible sponsors these book clubs. So if you're interested and in, I forget exactly what, I need to look it up again, what, what you get. I think if it's a free book, but um, it's audibletrial.com slash thrive after abuse and um, signing up supports, helps to support this channel, mm -hmm. do what we do and keep the book clubs going. And then it's a win-win because then you also get a free book for signing up. So thank you guys so much for joining us. We do this the last Thursday of uh, every month and at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So I hope you guys can enjoy or join us again next month. It's going to be even more fun. It will be. So yeah, hashtag mail, <laughs> hashtag mail dance. We'll, we'll see what you guys come up with. Yep. <laughs> I love that idea, Agatha. I don't know. I, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, okay so um yes yes this is great news because look at us you can be so happy <laughs> we were both very abused poor women so. yes <laughs> right so i love it i love it so yes. okay as always you guys you're not alone you never. are never and you are not crazy sometimes sometimes <laughs> In a controlled, in a controlled way, in a, uh, in a fun way. Yeah. And uh, you can absolutely heal from this. And I just encourage you to make that declaration of living a great life. Yeah. And it is absolutely possible. Yes, it is. So, yes. 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 With all the lemons, it's possible. With all the lemons, it's possible. Yeah. Absolutely. So mm -hmm. we'll see you guys. I'll see you next week, Wednesday, live stream, 830 PM Eastern Standard Time. All right. Good night, everyone. Okay. Good night. Bye, Dana. <laughs> Bye. I'll talk to you later. Okay. <laughs> okay. You should call me. Okay. <laughs>